Good morning. So the um, subject of this panel is uh, currency manipulation. What is currency manipulation? And because our panels are interdisciplinary, I'm going to have the good fortune to leave the technical details to Jay. Uh, so for so purposes of my presentation, I'll just say that currency manipulation is the intentional act of a government to lower the value of its currency from what it would or should otherwise be. Now, I don't know what country invented currency manipulation, but certainly the United States was one of the earliest indulgers. In 1933, President Roosevelt and the Congress took the United States off the gold standard by con forbidding the converting of dollars into gold. And later that year, Roosevelt ordered the Reconstruction Finance Corporation to buy gold to drive up its price in order to lower the value of the dollar relative to gold. By 1934, the dollar had been depreciated 40%. This helped the export of US commodities during the Depression. What happened to all that gold that Roosevelt bought? Safe storage became a problem. So the Roosevelt administration built a large storage facility in an army base called Fort Knox. Five decades after the US dollar devaluation in 1933, the US pulled off another important dollar manipulation in 1985. Unlike the 1933 unilateral action, our, the 1985 program was done in coordination with our major trading partners. This was the Plaza Accord of 1985, designed to depreciate the dollar in order to boost the US trade balance. In recent years, there have been several well-publicized episodes of currency manipulation, for example, by Switzerland in 2012 and by China a decade ago. All right, so what does currency manipulation or currency depreciation accomplish? Depreciating one's currency does not make a country wealthier than it was before the depreciation. If anything, depreciation makes the country less wealthy. Certainly, if having a low-value currency were a sure path to economic prosperity, then the World Bank would have an easy solution to the problem of poverty. But currency depreciation does not have that effect. So it doesn't make a country richer it can't possibly do that. But it can distort trade by boosting exports. In other words, a devalued currency can give a competitive advantage to certain sectors and make those companies better off. All right, in my presentation, I want to cover three points. First, what's the international law of currency manipulation? Second, what's the US law of currency manipulation? And third, how important is this issue for making America great again? My first point, uh, international law. The international organization with jurisdiction over currency devaluation is the International Monetary Fund, which was set up in 1944 with its main goal being to build a framework for economic cooperation to avoid a repetition of the competitive devaluations that had contributed to the Great Depression of the 1930s. The IMF Charter in Article 4 provides that IMF members shall avoid manipulating exchange rates to gain an unfair trade advantage. In 2007, the IMF gave additional guidance in the form of a decision on bilateral surveillance over members' policies, in which it states that the fund should make an objective assessment and consult with the member concerned. In such cons consultations, the fund staff are directed to give the member the benefit of any reasonable doubt. So that's the international rule. That the, that's the international process. Note, this is a fund member consultation mechanism, not a member member dispute settlement system like the World Trade Organization has. And so, being a fund member system, the IMF system hasn't been notably effective 
uh, in, in implementing and enforcing the rule against currency manipulation. Uh, so the IMF has a rule, but there's no effective enforcement mechanism. All right, so that's the international law. What's the U.S. law? The most recent U.S. law was passed in 2015. It's known as Section 701, or for my students here, uh, 19 U.S.C. 4421. That's the law that President Trump was referring to when he promised that on his first day in office, he would name China as a currency manipulator. Didn't happen. A few days after inauguration, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer taunted Trump, saying, Mr. President, if you really want to put America first, label China a currency manipulator. Still didn't happen. Now, what would it mean to name China a currency manipulator? What does Section 701 say? The first thing to note, if you look at the law, is it doesn't say much about currency manipulation. The only mention of currency manipulation in this law is it states that the president can instruct the U.S. executive director of the IMF to call for formal consultations. That's the process I talked about earlier. The U.S. executive director can call on the IMF to uh, call for formal consultations on findings of currency manipulation. Uh, the, the U.S. law doesn't even define currency manipulation. Think about that. Uh, third, the law sets in motion a process to review countries based on some criteria that I'll talk about, but the actions that the president can take under this law are fairly tame. Working with the IMF is one of the four actions specifically indicated that the president can take after one year of what's called enhanced bilateral engagement. And then after that enhanced bilateral engagement, a failure of the country concerned to adopt appropriate policies to correct the undervaluation found. This whole program under the law starts with a report by the Treasury Secretary containing an enhanced analysis of major U.S. trading partners where three conditions exist. First, the country has a bilateral U.S. trade surplus. Second, the country has a current account surplus. Third, the country is engaged in persistent one-sided intervention in the foreign exchange market. Three criteria. Not a definition, but sort of criteria for being named. Note that because the United States has large global trade deficits and large current account deficits, those global deficits will decompose into bilateral deficits with individual countries. And since the U.S. has bilateral deficits with other countries, arithmetically, the other countries will have bilateral surpluses with the United States. So in effect, two of the three conditions devised by our Congress in the law for enhanced analysis are totally pre-cooked. In other words, these are not objective criteria. They don't prove anything. Other countries are going to be in this position because of our uh, global uh, deficits. But what happens when you add the third criteria, the persistent one-sided intervention? Does that implicate China today? Would there be grounds under the law to name China today? Now, according to Fred Bergsten, the leading authority on everything related to trade and currency, China has met, met all three conditions between 2003 and 2010, but not since then. So looking at those three criteria, I would say there'd be no basis today for naming China a currency manipulator. But suppose we did anyways. What does that mean? There are four actions the president can take under this law. First, prohibit new overseas private investment corporation project financing. We don't do any of that in China. Second, prohibit federal government procurement from that country, but only, according to the U.S. law, only if consistent with our obligations under international agreements. Third, use the IMF 
and fourth, instruct USTR to take into account ass assessing this situation as to whether we should enter into trade negotiations with that country. It's kind of an odd criteria, an, an odd provision, because it doesn't say whether being a currency manipulator should make you more want to have trade negotiations or less. But anyway, so those are the four steps the president can take. Now, actually, these are all reasonable measures. We should be taking them anyways, I think, with respect to certain countries. These measures were designed by Sen Senator Michael Bennett uh, in writing this law. But note the law does not include countervailing duties against currency manipulator countries as proposed over many years by Senator Schumer. And I think it's a good thing because that'd be clearly a violation of the WTO to impose countervailing duties for that reason. So no action yet by the Trump administration, at least not as of last night. You have to look at the Trump administration <laughs> hour by hour. Uh, uh, but what did Trump say on, on Tuesday? Trump told pharma leaders that Japan, China, and Germany were guilty of global freeloading for using regulation and currency devaluation. He said those countries live on devaluation. Also that day, Trump's trade advisor, Peter Navarro, accused Germany of taking advantage of a grossly undervalued euro. Media coverage of those remarks brought denials from those uh, countries. That's the state of play, as far as I know, up to right now. Is there anything else that could be done? Here, Fred Bergsten uh, has offered the idea of a countervailing currency manipulation. In other words, as Bergsten explains it, if China buys a billion dollars worth of dollars to keep the dollar strong, then the U.S. could counter that by buying a billion dollars worth of RMB to neutralize the impact of China's currency intervention to drive down the value of its currency. Now, the Department of Treasury does have what's called an exchange stabilization fund that would allow it to purchase or sell foreign currencies. Currently, that fund has $45 billion. Not a big war chest for this sort of thing. But suppose we put $450 billion in it. That might be enough to run Fred Bergsten's program, but I'm not sure it would be politically acceptable to the public to say, we're going to take your tax dollars, $450 worth, and we're going to use it to buy Chinese currency. I don't think the public would think that's a, it's a good deal. All right, so I don't think that the United States should be targeting the trade deficit or a current account deficit either globally or bilaterally. Interesting statistical facts, but I don't think they, are, they really ought to be anything we, we try to target in our policies. As my college professor, Robert Triffin, pointed out over a half century ago, as the dollar takes on more of a role as a world reserve currency, the United States will tend to have a large balance of payment deficit that supply the dollars demanded in other countries. The dollar's role creates economic and political instability because it pushes the U.S. current account negative and other countries positive. I think we need to get at the root of that problem, the dollar's world, a role in the global economy. But that's a difficult project, and there are a lot of nuances to it because we gained some advantages, as de Gaulle pointed out years ago, in printing a world reserve currency. Okay. So that's international law, U.S. law. Now let me just a few thoughts on context. Making America great again requires coherent U.S. competitiveness policies. We don't have them today. We didn't really have them under the Obama administration either. We need robust capital investment, good sound tax policy, technology, manufacturing, more public infrastructure, good liberalizing trade policy, better education, training, immigration, uh, more open immigration. These are all policies we need to make our country great. And, these are, and we've got to design policies for the long run, not the short run. Anytime you design a policy for this year or next year, you're, you're necessarily going to be self-defeating. You've got to have long-term 
policies to, to improve the, the economy. So that's what we need. But we're not doing any of that. Indeed, we're seeing just the opposite. We need strong policies to open up foreign markets for trade. Instead, we're seeing from the Trump administration weak trade policies running from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, for example. The common theme in Trump's international economic policy seems to be to blame others for our faults. Mexico, China, Japan, Europe, Germany. Trump says they're stealing our jobs, stealing our prosperity, stealing our future, eating our lunch. Well, good policies, good economic policies begin at home. We don't need other countries' permission to do what's required to put the U.S. economy on a path to greater growth. GDP fourth quarter last year, 1.9 percent. Plenty of room for better policies. We need, it's good to have cooperation with other countries and international institutions. That will improve the outcomes that we're going to achieve. Uh, but there's a lot we can accomplish with our own autonomy. Probably 80 percent of what we need to do for our economy, we can do between the Congress and the President. So I think Trump is rightly blamed for the misinformation he has given about the international economy and about trade, suggesting that China today is manipulating its currency wrong, or that NAFTA was, is a catastrophe, he said the other day again, wrong. But aside from that misinformation, and you know, an enlightened public is very important for democracy, but aside from that misinformation, I think the greatest sin of President Trump may have been to try really to weaken the spirit of the American people, to tell American workers that they can't compete with China or Mexico without a Trump border tax, or to say that the United States has to break world rules in order to compete. When told by Meet the Press moderator Chuck Todd that his trade policies he offered during the campaign would violate internationally agreed trade law. Trump responded, it doesn't matter. Then we're going to renegotiate or we're going to pull out. Those trade deals are a disaster, Chuck. World Trade Organization is a disaster. In his inaugural address to the world, President Trump said, from this day forward, a new vision govern our land. From this moment on, it's going to be America first. Now, I don't know where Donald Trump drew inspiration in writing that speech, but I wish President Trump had given some thought to the farewell address of President Washington, the namesake of our university, when Washington counseled, observe good faith and justice towards all nations, cultivate peace and harmony with all. Thank you.